or not what we are collecting are not the entire organ but only small pieces of organ or a part of the body so very small that it would not hamper the ongoing biological process or ongoing pathophysiological processes that means let me give you an example of what of what, what, what i'm trying to say suppose by say the clinical signs and symptoms i suspect that a person is suffering from cancer say for example a liver cancer okay now when i will collect the uh, collect a part of the liver i mean liver is a, the i mean the largest gland of the body that you all know so if this be the liver it's not possible to collect the entire liver because if i collect the entire liver in that case what will happen the person would die i mean the purpose of the person uh, of this entire diagnosis is to save the life but instead of that happening the person would die if i collect the entire liver so what i'm going to do is i'm going to collect a small part of this liver mass as the sample only so the the major part of this liver would be kept there as intact so that whatever the functional ability is still present in the disease liver the functional ability is still maintained in the living body and the person can still survive as long as the diagnosis doesn't get confirmed so that is the concept of a tissue now how do we view the three dimensional things that is what i was speaking of in the last session we can view a three dimensional thing or an object from multiple different angles right as for example you are now viewing me from the front i mean like my camera is viewing me from the front now if i say for example rotate so you cannot see my front side you can see my one of the side of the body right accordingly uh, we do need to section a particular mass suppose this is the thing that we have collected so the collected material can have this kind of a shape arbitrary shape because we are collecting it not by its shape but by its location rather location means area where we are suspecting the disease to remain present so once we collect this as a sample we now have to know what is the structure of the part of this liver available under the microscope normally if we take a sample of liver from a normal healthy individual by that we can gain the idea of how the liver cells or the liver tissues look like for a normal healthy person normal healthy person means a person who is not having that particular disease called cancer okay now when you are performing basically biopsy before collecting this sample the histopathologist is supposed to have the idea of normal structure let me tell you that whatever diagnostic methods we are employing in the histopathology none of them are diagnosed based on the functions of the organs but rather all are diagnosed based on the structure okay so before we start diagnosing anything abnormal we need to have the idea of what the normal is basically the the primary lessons on histology deals with the normal structure under each magnification for each different organs why is this part important i think i have explained it in one class before that the amount of magnification contributes directly to what we see under the microscope as for example you are seeing now this sample now if i magnify it even more at one point of time what will happen you see the lines would become more thick so the finer details will emerge out and the gross details will spread apart so as the gross details spread apart finer details emerge out and that way we come to know whether those finer details are resembling the normal structure or not but before we do all these things whether be it the histopathology or whether be it for the histopathology 
there are certain methods of doing this. And the method first, obviously, is the collection, right? And after collection, what you need to do next is we need to fix it. This is a very important step, fixation. What is the concept of fixation? Let me explain. Suppose, uh, you know, most of us do consume meat or fishes as a part of our regular diet. And what we are buying from the markets are basically dead materials, right? We are buying dead fishes or killed fishes rather, or the, or the killed animals consumed as a meat. Now, when we are killing anything, that means we are forcibly inducing certain changes in the biological system, right? Now, if we keep that tissue, the tissue of the body of a fish, or the tissue of the body of the organism from which you have collected the meat. If we keep that material, say, simply idle aside, don't we find that after some days, the material will undergo a kind of putrefication, a kind of decaying, rottening. That means what? All this putrefication, decaying, rottening are causing changes in the tissue. Now, if we are willing to know what exactly are the life-like features of the tissue? Would you be able to know that if we put that part under the microscope? A dead, rotten, decayed part. If that part is put under the microscope, would that part give us the idea of what the normal healthy structures are? Is it possible to get that idea? No. So that's why what we need is fixation in which we fix the life-like resemblance. What is the concept of life-like resemblance? I am living right now. So all my organs are living. Now, whatever the structures of individual tissues inside all the different organs of my body, if I can see those, then what I am seeing are the characteristics of the structure while the tissue is still live and intact. And we need to see those living features. Now, the moment you take a tissue out of the body, from that moment onwards, changes gradually begin in the tissues. Changes which destroy this lifelike resemblance, right? Simple, I mean, if you just keep a tissue simple uh, onto a plate for half an hour or one hour, that is sufficient to destroy the structure of the tissue, right? It will be dehydrated in the first place because every tissue contains some amount of water. If you keep it aside, the water part of the tissue will evaporate. And as that water part evaporates, the tissue will be dehydrated. And as the tissue dehydrates, the tissue will gradually shrink. Now, this shrunk structure is not going to give you the idea of what the structure was before we collected the tissue from the living matter. We need to find out the features as exactly it is present in the living state. In the dead state, whatever it's present doesn't give us any kind of diagnostically valued information. Since we need to know what is there going on inside the living, but diseased body, so we need to have the structure of the living condition intact, even though we are collecting or extracting the tissue out of the living body. Because if the tissue undergoes a change out of the living body, if we see that changed tissue, we are not going to have any valuable information that will give us a conclusion or a confirmation as to what kind of disease is the patient suffering from. So we need to have the living features intact. Is everybody understanding? Yes, sir. Okay. Pran yes, sir. Yes, sir. While I am living, Pran is diseased. Yes, sir. That we need to know. And to know that, 
the first step is fixation. So in the fixation, what do you do? We basically fix so that no further changes are possible in the tissue. And to do this, we have multiple different techniques. Mostly the agents which are used for the purpose of fixations are known as fixatives. One such very common fixatives, though not used always in the histopathological laboratory, that is formal dehyd. But whenever we are dissecting, in the, in the video that I published yesterday, there was a concept of cadaver. And in the concept of cadaver, I explained that the bodies, dead bodies, if they are left idle, then they will decompose. In order to prevent them from decomposing, what is added in those dead bodies are fixatives. The most common one is formaldehyde. But formaldehyde do have its own drawbacks. I will give you the idea of what ideal fixatives are and how to use those fixatives. I'll be selecting few fixatives and we'll be giving you the important characteristics which make them a better fixatives than the rest. Even some cases, fixatives are tissue specific. That means a particular type of tissue is better fixated with one particular type of fixatives than the other types. I can give you a list of those fixatives as well as the tissue specificity of those fixatives. But what next? What next after we fix the tissue? After we fix the tissue, in order to see anything, I mean, what do you like to see? Whether would you like to see anything in this black and white format? Or you want to see anything in the color format, multiple colors, which helps you to see things better? Color or black and white? Sir, sir color format. Exactly. Sir, color, format. color format. And to color up the tissue, we do need to use something called dyes. What are dyes? Dyes are coloring matter. And the technique of coloring a tissue is known as to stain. S-T-A-I-N-I-N-G. That's a very important step. Staining. Because the staining helps us differentiate individual portions of the tissues. As for example, if I take a cell in a tissue, if everything is white inside, then would you be able to differentially localize the nucleus? Is it possible? If the color of the nucleus and the color of the cytoplasm remains the same, it's not possible. So exactly for that reason, it will be better if we can color up the cytoplasm in a different color and the nucleus again in a different color. So if the color of the cytoplasm and the color of the nucleus are different in that case, it will be easier for you to distinguish these individual cells or the cellular organelles. Right. And for that, we do need to use stains. Finally, what you are trying to see is the structure because after only seeing the structure, would we be able to find out whether the seen structure is exactly the structure as should be seen in the living healthy mass? Or is there any difference in the structure from what should be there in the living healthy mass? If there be a difference, you will thus report what kind of difference and what usually do those differences mean. If the differences signify a pathology, then you will simply write in your report that changes are seen, which indicates this and this disease. And the rest of the thing is now left to the, to the clinical physician, who is going to take up that report, is going to read that report. And finally, by combining with other diagnostic information, the physician is going to make the final diagnosis as what to be done next to the patient. Understanding, why is staining important now? So staining is important, so that we can differentially color individual parts of the tissues. Because only by the differential colorations, it would be possible for us to differentiate individual structures of the tissue. Clear? Is the concept clear? What do you need to stain? Yes, sir. Yes, now, sir. Yes, sir. 
are these tissues macroscopic? I mean, are they very big? They are not big, no. right? They no, are but microscopic. Now, you already have performed microscopy and you know somewhat the principle of microscopy. So in a microscopy, what happens? Suppose if this be, if this, if this plane surface be the stage of a microscope, there is a small little hole. I would consider, I will call it as hole for the time being, which allows the passage of light, right? At the base of the microscope, there is a mirror, which is a kind of a focusing mirror. And that mirror, what does is, you have seen probably that the mirror is a kind of a concave mirror. So in the concave mirror, what happens? Light from all the directions are collected in that mirror. And that light is allowed to pass through the small hole present on the stage. Finally, since we have to see the structure, what I said, we have to see the structure with the help of our eyes. We can only see when light would fall into the retina of our eye. That is what we know from our lessons of anatomy and physiology. I mean, if light is not falling onto the retina, there is no way of seeing it. Now the thing is, if I am putting a slide, suppose if this be the slide, if I'm putting the slide, if the slide is a very thick one, is it possible for the light to pass through a very thick tissue? As for example, would you be able to see what is present behind me? No, because this is the thickness of my face and my chest. It doesn't allow the pass, allow the light to pass to my back and thereby get reflected to your eyes. So that's why you would not be able to see what is present behind. But if say I hang here a very fine film, a kind of almost transparent colored film, then it would be easier for you to see what is present at the back of the film, right? Similarly, in order to see the tissue, we would not be able to see it if the attempt is made with a very thick mass. With a very thick mass, light would not be able to pass through. I am trying to illustrate it by drawing on the board that if this be the stage of the, and if this is a hole out here, so there is a concave mirror, if this be the concave mirror, which is focusing the beam of light. And you are seeing with your eyepiece right here on the top, it's present on the top of the microscope. So the light, let me draw the color of the light in a different color. The light would pass through the eyepiece and finally you would see it. But out here, if the light is, if the light has to pass through, whatever the slide that will keep or whatever the tissue mass that will keep needs to be not very thick. If this be a very thick, a block kind of thing, this light would not pass. But if I make the slide, instead of this thick, a very thin slide, then it is easier for the light to pass, right? Patla the light than the That is a basic concept. So after we stain this, or even sometimes in few tissues before staining, what we do need is to perform sections. We call this as sectioning. There are even other processes before staining, you know. I will come to that. After sectioning only, the tissue will now be, will be ready for mounting. What is it to mount? After you make a fine section, you now need to put that section on a glass slide. Again, you need to cover up that slide so that whatever fluid material be present in that section, that section doesn't get dried up. Because if that section also gets dried up, again, there will be a shrinkage. And as the tissue section will shrink, again, you will not get under the microscope the normal appearance or the life appearance in the life. 
Understood? So that's why you need to mount. So the fourth step is to mount it. Okay. Now there are, I mean, multiple intermediate steps in as for example, between the step two and the step three, there will be a thing that is called embedding. Why do you need to embed? What is embedding by the way? Embedding is suppose if this blue mark represents a tissue, a tissue by nature is soft, right? And when you will section this tissue, that is the third step, you will definitely use something of a blade kind of thing or a knife kind of thing. We do have definite instruments for that. That instrument is known as microtome. But in the microtome also, the blade concept is there. There are many different types of blade. Blade can either be made up of glass or can be made up of metals. If it is nervous tissue, it's better not use to use metal. It can, for some hard tissues, it is even made up of diamonds. Blades are also available in the microtubes. But the thing is, consider one thing, that if I draw with this color of the knife, so this is the sharp edge of the knife. At this point of contact between the knife and the tissue, would there not be a local deformation because the knife is going to press this tissue and as the knife would press the tissue there will be a small depression produced out here and not only depression we can also call it a bit deformation would take place next time when you go to the kitchen for cutting any vegetables before cutting it, simply press the knife on a particular part of your vegetable and find out that that area of contact undergoes a small amount of depression. Now you are cutting big vegetables, but here we are concerned with small microscopic tissue samples. So this amount of deformation is sufficient to produce error in what we are seeing. Error means to produce differences from the normal healthy state. Are you getting the point? So we, what we do need to do is, we need to find out some techniques that will prevent this deformation from happening. And for that, we do have in place an embedding media. So what's there in the embedding media? Suppose with this color I'm drawing all around the tissue, something, the embedding media. Should be writing it as embedding. Okay, so once the tissue is embed in this media, after that, if I use the knife to section the tissue, the initial pressure of the knife would not be directly on the tissue, but now would be directly on the embedding media. So the initial deformation would be on the embedding media. And since the embedding media is now surrounding all throughout this small sample, so the pressure that is exerted by the help of, uh, I mean, by the knife on one part of the tissue would be balanced by similar pressure on the other part of the tissue as well. And thus, this deformation would be minimized or would become nil. Understood why embedding is necessary. Okay, now that is one step that I said that has to be performed before section embedding. Another steps are also, another intermediate steps are also there that can, should be performed, say, before staining. As for example, most of the tissues contain quite a huge amount of water, right? Now, if you directly put stains into those 
water containing tissues what will happen the tissues either would swell up right or would undergo shrinkage as for example if this is the container or a or a beaker into which i have kept a stain now i am putting this blue colored tissue into this stain so either there will be an entry or there will be an exit of the material of the tissue by exit what do i mean the water will exit water content to exit right now as the stain gradually enters into the mass of the tissue in this big volume of water the stain would get diluted small amount of stain in a big amount of or a big volume of water what will happen would you be able to see that stain any more as for example there is a big bucket of water and you drop small amount a single drop of uh, ink would that ink be visible throughout the water no it would get all dispersed and diluted similarly since the tissue is having a high volume of water no matter how much stain we provide to this uh, in this condition that stain would all get diluted and as the stain undergoes the dilution the result is that uh, a kind of vague appearance is produced so what do we first do need to do is even before staining that is we do need to dehydrate the tissue but remember in the course of dehydration there should not be any loss of structure because that theme that means prevention of any loss of structure should be right there from the collection till the final examination under the microscope but if dehydration be fast that would cause shrinkage right if anything is dehydrated what would happen that would cause a shrinkage and that shrinkage in turn would cause a loss of structure again in addition since you don't know what kind of solution or what is the tonicity of the cell mass that you have collected unknowingly you can also do another damage to this tissue that is if the concentration if the solute concentration if the uh, inside the tissue is high in that case from outside the water can even enter so if the water is entering into the tissue in that case what will happen the tissue would swell up again there is a loss of structure we do not need either the swelling neither the shrinkage we need only to have the water part removed and with the removal of the water part that parts now should be replaced replaced by some other materials so that the volume loss created by the loss of water gets replenished by the volume of another material which would help the cell to remain intact in the life like form are you understanding what i'm trying to say okay so that's why first we need to remove the water okay after that we need to fill in those vacant parts with some other material so that the life like state state is preserved and even after that in some tissues we do need even to decalcify in which tissues in those tissues which are having a high amount of calcium namely the bone masses because if we are not decalcifying the bones in that case what will happen the blades that we are using for sectioning that blades would become blunt very easily and if you try to section a tissue with a blunt blade you understand the damage to the tissue would even be more because in the in the blunt state what will happen is you will apply more amount of pressure because the blunt blade is not going to cut that easily as easily as a sharp blade would cut so 
in an attempt to cut it, if you apply more amount of pressure, that means you are applying more amount of deforming force on the tissue. So as you are applying more amount of deforming force on the tissue, the tissues are getting even more deformed. In that case, again, there is a loss of structure. The theme of this entire process is preservation of structure as close as the lifelike form. That is the main theme of this entire process. So did you now understand that what, what are the individual importances of all these steps that finally gives you a tissue that you can observe under the microscope. The final thing after the mounting is obviously the microscope. Uh, if When you are sectioning the tissue, uh, you need to be aware of the planes of section because just now, as I was explaining, if you view me from the front plane, some parts will get viewed. If you view me from the sides, then other parts would be viewed, right? So it's depending upon the direction of your view that uh, some individual aspects of the viewed materials will be presented to you, right? Did you understand the concept now? So these are the different steps. I will come to those individual steps uh, separately. And for each of these individual steps, there are uh, certain agents that can be carried out. There are certain tools that can be used to carry out these individual steps. And I will come to that. But grossly speaking, these are the steps that is most common to any and every of the histological methods. Even when you are working in the histopathological laboratory on a routine day-to-day -day basis, you need to carry out each of these steps. The steps might differ in their agents, might have minute differences <clears throat> in the exact ways of its execution. Okay. But these steps are necessarily carried out. Otherwise, you cannot perform any histopathological examination of a collected mass. Are you understanding the concept? Now, uh, I'd better stop the record. And uh, if any one of you are having any kind of uh, questions based on what I have taught so far, you can ask those questions.